So if you look at example two on page 293, we have uh, an equation, um, right, where we have, uh, do you see the line number one where it's y plus 11 equals, uh, I mean minus, well equals 2x? If you can see that, that's not in our, in our form, right? Uh, It's not in our, our, our form, like, let me write that down. Go ahead and somebody read that for me. Uh, read those two equations on the example. Y plus 11 equals 2x. And then 5x equals y plus 26. OK. So what, form are, what forms are those in right now? Well, they're in no form <laughs> that we know of. To be in standard form, the variables have to be on the same, same side. So if I'm going to like subtract a y, then I can have 11 right, equals 2x minus y. Do you see that? And on the other one, then what I want, actually, what do I got here, 5y? Or what do I, what do I got here? It's just a y. Oh, that's a y, my scribble. y. OK, so in this case, I'm going to have over here, I'm going to have 26, right? I'm going to subtract 26, get it over that side, and then I'm going to have a, a minus 5x plus a y. You see what I did? I just got a two variables. This is a plus. You see that? Yeah. So actually, let me write it like this. I'm going to flip it around so it looks like 2x uh, minus y equals 11, right? And over here, we're going to have, uh, so over this one here was going to be minus 5x plus y yeah, equals minus 26. OK, basically, I still want to solve for y and x. But I'm not graphing now. I just And I'm not using substitution. So I want to use elimination. Well, one thing I can see here, just by, by chance, if I take uh, this guy, this whole line here, and I add it to this guy, I want it red. OK, and then I look at the result. So I'm going to leave this guy the same, right? 2x minus y equals 11. But when I add this to there, I'm going to have, what, minus 3x, aren't I? Is that okay? And what is minus y plus y? What's nothing in mathematics? I don't know what nothing means. What is the symbol for nothing? Zero. Yeah, okay. I guess you could say nothing is zero. So it's nothing. Zero, right? Equals minus 26. So I could, I could put here plus zero, right? Is it 15? Oh, yeah. Right. I'm going to add that on. Good. Right here. So that one's going to be, I have to add that too. So that's minus 15. OK. Now, look what happened. By using this one to eliminate this variable here, look what we have left. We have minus 3x equals minus 15, you see. So now I know my x-intercept, where the 2 would intercept at, would be, you know, 5. Uh, of course, like any of these, then I can go back to either one of these equations. Uh, maybe this one here, see? 2 times 5 is 10, and then, uh, right? So y is going to be equal to 1? Does anybody see that? So if I take my 5 and stuff it up into my x, right? 2 times 5 is 10. I have to be careful, though, because that's a minus y, right? So, but this is 10, right? So if I subtract 10, I'm going to have a 1, right? But I'm going to multiply both sides by minus 1, so I'm going to have, I'm going to have, in effect, minus 1. 
Now, if that's correct, then it should work here, right, where y is equal to minus 1. That's 10, yeah, and then 2 times 5 is 10. You see? So we're going to develop this thing, and this thing it gets to the point where when you get out in the real world, there's a program called linear programming. And all, all especially programming, especially all of the, uh, like, um, any, any kind of business that has all sorts of different uh, functions, like airlines. And airlines would have different hubs, different times, how many planes, how much it cost, what's the revenue. You have all of these equations, right? Not just x, y, but x, y, z, l, m, n. I mean, uh, still, they're sheets, they're like planes, and they're still linear. But you want to put them all together, and that tells the airline company how many planes should be at what airport to maximize profit. So, um, so let's try one now. So that's like the very beginning, and then, um, so uh, let's try something here. So uh, they have this thing called the alternative method. Okay, so that tells us basically you're going to have a process of elimination now. Uh, let's see. So let me show you how to do one. Uh, let's do one here so that we know we have the answer to. I'm going to show you how we do it with linear programming, okay? Um, hmm. Were these all are uh, uh Okay, uh, let's pick number. Uh, Okay, let's do number, I don't know, 23. That's going to be 23 on page 296. Uh, somebody want to read me that? This is actually a three, right? So now, they are in standard form, aren't they? Because all my variables are on one side and they're lined up. Okay, so I'm going to do the process of elimination, but I'm going to do the, the linear programming way. Now, when you do the linear programming way, we know that this is the x and this is the y column, right? So I'm going to write a matrix like this, and I'm going to call this three, three, 5, minus 2, and then a dotted line. And then this will be equal to 30. Is that 33? Or 35? 33. And then this is 27. And then I close my, this is called a matrix that holds a package of information. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to manipulate this one to, to try to get rid of one of these variables. So basically what you want to do is you want to get rid of, you want to drive this guy, there's like a triangle, you want to drive that guy to zero because that leaves only one variable that you can solve. Now, if you had something like this, x plus y plus z equals something, and then you had 2x plus 1y plus 3z equals to, well, equals to something else. And so you would need three equations, right? Because you have three unknowns. So you would need yet another equation, which I'm just making up, you know, equals something else. Guess what? You would now have a matrix of three. One, two, three, and then that. So you would have something like this, or you would have something here, 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 dotted line, and then here, and then here, 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 and dotted line. So the goal would be, you see that we drove this triangle? In this case, we will be driving something that looks more like 
Uh, I got one, two, well, this is, yeah, one, two, three. So I want to have a triangle like this. That's the triangle of which I want to drive to zeros. Why? Because it leaves me with one variable equal to something here so that I can solve it. That would be for a three-dimensional plane, right? But in this case, I'm really looking to drive 5 equal to 0 because this is the y. If x is equal to 0, then I know y equals that. I can solve it, and then I can back substitute. It's really what we just did, but in a kind of a formal way in which the program can be written for the computer to solve the problem. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this guy, and, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this by uh, well, the first thing I'm going to do is just multiply it by uh, one-third. I'm just going to, I can do that because I'm going to be doing it to both sides. So when I do that and I bring in the one-third this way, you see, the result's going to be what? One, one, eleven. True? And this one's still the same, right? Minus two equals twenty-seven. You see, I, there's nothing wrong with dividing both sides, all, you know, multiplying by one-third. I'm a purposely making this a one here because it's going to make it easier to get rid of this guy, the five, which I want to make it equal to zero. And so, I'm going to do that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to multiply this row up here, but I'm just going to use it to manipulate the second row. So I'm going to multiply this side minus 5 times this row, and the result of that I'm going to add to the second row. My first row will actually stay the same. I'm just using it to manipulate, so I'm going to write it right above it. I'm going to have here a minus 5, another minus 5, and a minus 55. Do you see that? Now I'm going to add that to the second row. Notice that right here, this all staying the same. I mean, I've still got 1, 1, 11, right? But now, when I add minus 5 to 5, what do I get? Don't say nothing. Zero. Yeah. Zero. Aha. Uh -huh. That's my triangle of zeros. So, how about this one? When I take minus 5 plus minus 2. Wow, good. And what about 11 plus 27? This is slow moving. No, I've been at. Oh, yeah, right. I'm adding minus 55 to 27. Okay, now, remember this is my x column and this is my y column, right? Let's put the variable back in now. What this bottom row is saying, that we have whittled it down to 7y equals minus 28. And if I divide, what do I have? My y critical value, where the intercept is equal to? You see that? We solved it. Now. Now that I got y equals 4, you know, I can easily go back to this guy, see, where I'm backtracking now. You see where I have 3x plus 3y equals 33? So I'm just going to plug in my 4 in there so that I have 3 times 4 plus 3y equals 33. So now I have 12, right, plus 3y equals 33. And then I want to subtract, right? So I got, what, 21? Oh. I plugged it in the wrong guy, did I? Yeah. OK. Don't, don't do that. Plugged it into the wrong guy. I should have been plugging it into, well, why? 3x plus, now the 4 times 3 is 12. And then we still have our 33. Yeah, so now we have 3x, and now I'm going to subtract the 12, right? So we have the 21. 
And so I have my x where the two lines would meet. And the x thing would be equal to 7. So the solution should be 7 comma 4. And that should work here in both cases when x is, th that's 35 minus 8. That works. And then this is, well, it doesn't really matter, but that's 21 uh, plus 12. Does anybody understand anything that I just did? Yeah? No or yeah? It's still just doing what we did before, right? When we just, we had it in slope-intercept form. And then we set both y's equal to each other, solve for x. This is a way that is much more uh, convenient, if you will, for a computer. They don't need to set it in slope form. They just need to whittle it down, a process of what they call pivoting. Go, you, and you have to drive these to zero first. Then go up to here and drive that to zero. You can't just put zeros willy-nilly. You have to like always drive this one zero, and then the one below it zero, and then over here to zero, so that so that you don't screw up your zeros while you're doing the manipulation. Okay. Let's see. Um. brings me to a point here that I should cover. Mm. Let's see. I wanted to talk to you about functions because uh, as we get into calculus or trigonometry and even college algebra, Instead, we start using the symbolism of function, which is not hard. It just takes a little while to get used to. Let's see. Uh, this is function. Uh, okay, that should be page um, 250. Let's see, this is on page 250. We're going to have the definition of a function. Yeah, later, yeah. I, I heard it. Good. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's sort of like hieroglyphics. Uh, yeah, I, I, Egyptian. You know, uh, I, I, I'm kind of scatterbrained when it comes to math because I, I write it down. It makes sense to me at the time. Right. It's sort of like um, a kind of. Uh, Sort of episode that you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So do I need, like, well, yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm gonna hand it to you back so that you can kind of like put squares around what's the actual answer. No, I think it's a good idea to circle in any case. Whether you know, uh, sorry. it's okay. It's just good for my, you know, saves my eyesight. Trying yeah. to figure it out. Um, it's big enough, but. Okay, uh, any, are we okay with this or no? Okay, good, so we got that. Now, let's talk about a whole new field of area now. It's called a function. Anybody that's going to go into a little higher math will have to look cool, and you'll have to know what functions are. What is a function? I think I showed her one time already. Let's see, but I'll show all of you now. Let's talk about a function. So a function... Oh, we, we, we. A function can be written more, more generally like this, f of x. Now, you notice that's a little x, it's not a capital x, but 
It's just waiting for you to put X in there. So when I say something like whatever I want to, I can say, let's say Q is equal to F of X. So what I'm saying is that Q, right, is the dependent variable. It just gives me more information. X is independent. Independent. So, we're used to seeing something like this. Well, we know that's slope-intercept form. And we know the slope is 3 and the intercept's 2, right? Do we? Yes. So, now, more formally, we could write it like this. Instead of saying the y, we could write it as f of x equals 3x plus 2. That actually is just telling people for sure. Now, you can still let this equal to y. But it's just letting people know that this is a recipe for generating y's. We're going to plug in x, and out comes y's, right? So this recipe is the function. And it has to obey certain rules to be a function, but in general, we call this a function. And it's telling us that x is the dependent variable. It can be any letter, right? I call y because it's a function, but it could be just as well g of x. And then we define what it is. It's 3 plus 2. So um, let's see if we can give you an idea of what that means in um, some kind of symbolic form. Let's suppose that I have a factory. OK, I have some kind of factory. And this factory, uh, it has some, it has some, uh, let's say, carbon emitting stacks, right? Let's see. And yeah, that's pollution coming out. OK, now let's say that I have a conveyor belt feeding in. And of course, we're going to have in. And so this conveyor belt, this might be the in entrance to the factory. We don't know exactly what, how it works, but we know this is a conveyor belt. And this thing's going to be taking in values of x. And then out here, we're going to have, um, you know, after the x is used up, it's going to come out here like another conveyor belt, the same x that we dropped in. Right. But now our output was going to be right here. It's going to be coming out on this conveyor belt. Okay. This is our output. This is out. This is in. So this is a conveyor belt going out. And then these will drop into a silo. You know what a silo is? So it'll drop in a kind of a silo. Um, Actually, I'm going to call these the X guys here. And this is the Y out. So this is a real out here. And this is the, the old X values I put through. Is that right? No. Let me go back. OK, so yeah, I'm, 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 I was correct to begin with. Sorry about that. So this is, is out. OK, so watch what happens then. Here comes a helicopter, let's say with a gigantic net, net underneath. Let's see. Right, and it's a helicopter. And it has tethered to it a gigantic basket of some sort. This basket here, huge basket. And this basket is full of different values of x. Notice that when I, I put this x, it's a sub x. It's an x, a little one below the x. That means an x value, any x value. Different than x2. Different than x3. And so on. 
and x and x and x all the way to you know however many x's yeah so they start falling off so here comes off one onto our conveyor belt so here comes x1 and x1 starts going towards this way right and, and then it goes processes it and then smoke stacks up you know as it's processing it's coming out this way so here comes the first guy that we that we have so uh, we put an X in and so here after it's processing now the X1 is traveling like this over because it's already been used it's been used in the factory the factory is the function and it's a it's using a, re a recipe in this case it's 3x plus this is telling you what to do how, how to take that X and process it into a Y so when that X comes in, then come out here is a Y1 that coordinates with that X1. Then comes down here, the next guy traveling along is X sub 2 and so forth, right? And then out comes uh, the X sub 2 we use, but then behind this comes a Y sub 2, right? So when they're falling off, they're falling into this kind of like silo I was talking about. So the first thing that's going to drop right from here going to be x1 right but that when it went through our function machine produced a y1 and then guess what comes through yeah x2 y2 and so on to the nth nth it means the final one y sub n okay so and what are these known to us as each one of these guys is a point on a graph. This is how we graph a function. Before we were finding particular ones, right? X-intercepts and Y-intercepts, they're in here. Okay, so a function is the recipe by which you take in these X's. Now, the set of all X's that can work is called the domain. This is the domain. And the set of all y's that it can produce, all the y's, the set of all the y's, the name of it is called the range. OK? Now, not everything can work. I mean, not every value at work all the time. For example, suppose I have a function, and it's this. Why, I can see that every value of x works except for 0 because it's undefined. So it's not allowed in that domain. So the domain would be all real numbers except for x equals 0, you see. So it's not always every number that will work. It depends on the restriction of the, re the recipe itself. Is this OK or no? Is that right so far? So we have definition. All the possible values of x that are allowed to be done and put into this recipe are the domain. They get trickled off, x1, x2, x3, x4. And so what does that look like graphically? So it says this is, this is the rule. Now, what, not, not every curve is a function. If a curve is not a function, it's called a relation. Oh, <laughs> why do I have this? I'm not sure. But anyway, let's, let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to show you graphically then what this means, this function thing. So oh, let's see, okay. Graphic. Okay, so now let's talk about that and say we got the helicopter dumping those in and we have this thing. Now let's suppose we want to graph it. And I'm just graphing these as I please, right? Because I don't actually have numbers, but if I were to graph it, and this thing here is, you know, capital Y. Notice it's different than these little guys. These are individual ones. The cursive is individual. This is capital X. Okay. Now, if I wanted to graph this point, I would call this one, say, I mean, I'm just, it doesn't really matter where I put it. I know it's linear, but it really I don't know. So I just put, like here, this one would be x1, comma, y1, right? Would be, let's say, right here. And then right here would be, you know, x2, comma, y2. Okay, and then dot, 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 right here, and here, and dot, dot, all the way to some point where we might have 
you know, x to the nth term, comma, y sub n. You're right? And then after that, you know that we can do what we've, you know, you connect the points, right? And that gives you a graph of what? Of your function f of x is equal to 3x plus 2. We've been writing it like y, but this is just looks cooler when you say y equals f of x. You know, it's hard to find why we're using f of x, but I'm trying to tell you that it's letting you know that y depends on x, which you knew anyway. But sometimes, as it become more variables, you want to know which variables are the ones that are waiting for a helicopter to drop into them. OK, so the rule for this thing is called the vertical rule. So suppose you have a blue laser, and you have the blue laser is on a track around here, a kind of a track. And now this is the blue laser, and it's going to shoot a beam of light up, right? And then it's going to track all underneath the function. And look what happens if this shoots up. And let's say that's a reflective line. It's going to shoot over to here, or so some x value, right? This x of 1, where it reflects back, that's y sub 1. And so too here, or wherever it is, I got, you know, then if the laser tracks here, right? So here's the x sub 2, and this is like y sub 2, and so forth. You understand what I'm saying? I'm going to let this laser track through. Now, notice that every time, for every x, any particular x, notice I get one y value, right? And then I got an x. Still, for every x, I'm going, and I'm only getting, for every x, I'm getting one y value. You see that? Now, if I had a curve like this, Let's say it's parabolic, so it looks like this. And this is y, and this is x. Now look what happens when my blue laser runs through here. OK, so here underneath I have a blue laser running through like this. And it's shooting up a beam this way. So notice that it, when it goes up, it hits here. So there's some x sub 1 here, right? And it's going over here, and here's some y sub 1, right? Yeah? So let's say it's tracking down here. So now it's right here. And now we have an x sub 2, and it goes up, and it tracks, and it goes across, and there's a y sub 2, right? But I know at some point over here, let's say uh, x sub 4, for example, right? x sub 4 goes up. And guess what? It hits that same value. So actually, they're sharing this y. You know, it's OK, because one x produced a y. It's OK. But still, for one x, there's one y. OK, that's all right. But what we can't have, and what is not considered a function, would be a graph like this, where I have y and x. And let's say I have a circle. Now look what happens for any particular x here. If I have an x, x of 1, this thing blows apart because here I have an x of 1, right? But look, I actually have two y values coming out. That's not a function. That would be like this thing. The, what would this be like? Like something freaky happened to the machinery that an x1 came in, and this one produced not only x1, y1, but then an extra y. We can't have that. We can't have more than two y's for any one x. We can share the same values of y, right? But not, we can't have something that has a freak thing that put one x and produced out two, two different y's. That's exactly what's going on with this. So is this a function, for example? That's not a very good curve, but how about this? A parabola on its side. Run the laser test. So let's suppose you put the laser here. Well, you can shoot it two ways. Boom, 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 boom. Nope. For any one x, you got two, two y's. It's not a function. It's a relation. However, you know, if I want to just look at one part of it, and I can make this part analytical, because, you know, if suppose I only take half of this, then that is a function. 
um, obviously a line is going to always be a function because I'm always going to get a different x for a different, a different y for a different x. But you know, it doesn't have to be that way. I can, like in the case of a parabola, this x1, that was when it was like, say, x minus 2 is equal to this. And then this is like x equals 2, and it's also equal to that y. But it's still OK, because for every one x, we're getting one y. At no point, we can get two different y's for one x. That, as long as we have a domain that doesn't affect, violate a rule like 1 over x. And then, uh, and now we know that the collection of those points coming out of the factory are our points on the graph. And simply, for 1x, we need 1y. It's not that hard to, to... Anyway, that's the basic understanding of what a function is. That's just really more detail, uh, more information that it's telling me my output is depending on whatever I'm dropping into x. And it's also telling you that at no point will the factory for 1x ever come out with two y's. That would be a violation of what the definition of a function would be. Yeah? So let's see if we can try one of this. Um, so if you look at page 251, at the bottom of the page, mm, they don't have it as elaborate as I do with smokestacks and things like a factory, but they show x going in and y coming out. But they're not showing what's happening after it comes out. I mean, it forms a, it forms a, a coordinate, see? OK, now, let's take a look at um, page 252. So you can see on the diagram, the first diagram, A, letter A, you see that red vertical line going through? So for 1x on the x-axis, we have a y1 and a y2. That's bad. That's like for 1x coming into the factory, it somehow broke and produced two y's. That's not. But look at the line. That's in unit uh, picture B. You see that? As you run that, no, I'm going to run that laser now. That laser not just staying in that spot. It's running through the whole, it's like a copying machine. You know that laser that goes across to make a copy? It's like that. And it's looking for two y's for any one x. This will never have, this will always have one y for one ever, for whatever x, right? Not only that, they will never repeat, right? Because each y is different for each x. But this one down here, the parabola, you see where it says x comma y1? Well, you could go to the left of it and find a spot where there's another x, and it's also going to be equal to y1, right? Because it's going to go back. And that's OK, because still, it's just one x for one y. Even though they've used that particular y value before, it doesn't matter. Just as long as you have two coordinates to graph a point, then that is. So, so we can see that the first one is the only one that's not a function. If it's not a function, it's a relation. Because you can still use it to graph, but you have to be careful of the no longer being right. OK, now, let's find the domain and the range. This is on the bottom of 253. So now I want to know all possible inputs of x. And I want to know all possible of outputs of y. And if I know them, then each one respectively will be its domain. This, the domain will be the set of all x that can work. And the range will be the set of all y's. OK, so. Uh, Let's take a look at example, the one, the one there that's at the, the, let's see example four. Example four or y equals x squared. Does anybody see that? Okay. So let's say I have y equals x squared. So I have y equals x squared. Now. Is there any value of x that we can't use here? Is there any number that's a violation? Is there any number that we can't square? Not really. We can square any number, right? So my domain, 
will be equal to the set. When you have that kind of parenthesis, you set of all x. This means such that <coughs> x is an element. This means it's an element of the real number system. That's how you say that x is the domain. This thing here means the word means this this parenthesis means set. The domain equals the set of all values of all values of x, all x. And this bar here means such that. Such that. And then such that what? That x are an element of the real number system. Well, the real number system is everything except for the complex numbers, remember? Now, let's take a look at the graph of that. Now, this is a function. Now, I can look at y like this. f of x, you know, that's y, of course. But the recipe that's going through is this. So let's suppose that we have this domain dropping x's in. So let's, let's make our own little silo. Or this is x and this is y. It's clear when x is equal to 0, what is y? Yes. Right, because two copies, this is the same as cha-ching, cha-ching. 0 times 0 is 0, yeah? So over here, I can probably try x equals 1. If x equals 1, what is y? Uno. How about if x equals minus 1? OK, how about if x equals 2? Not hard. Do you know, know what I mean? Uh huh. What if it's minus two? Four again, right? <coughs> These are coordinates. These are the things we need to graph. This is a curve. Anything that's a higher power than one is a curve, not a line. So if we want to graph it, all right, we'll go like this. This is capital X, capital Y. And now let's graph it. Well, zero, zero. Is that right? One? One, one. One, one. Minus one, one. Minus two. Four. <coughs> I mean two, four. And minus two. Guess what? <coughs> so if I combine that, this is a parabola like this. And that's the graph of f of x equals x squared. OK, now, I am not telling you it's a function. But you can see if you run your laser, for every 1x, you're just going to get 1y. And no point will a minus 1 produce a 1 and, let's say, then 5, too. <coughs> so we know it's a function. However. I already know what my domain is. Now, can somebody tell me what my range? What are all the possible values for my y guy? That's my range. <coughs> Basically, this is an infinite set, isn't it? It's a set of all real numbers. But this is infinite set too, but it has a, um, it has a minimum value. So, so that now we're talking about the range. And that's equal to the set of y such that y is going to be greater than or equal to what? That's right, zero. Okay. But less than and equal to? What's the highest it can go up? That's the set. That's my range. Hmm. Okay. That's 
interesting. That's the range. I hope you get it. <laughs> Any questions? So, yeah. No, because it never goes there. Oh, that's right. Okay, because it's outside zero. Yeah, right. Any negative number is flipped up to a positive. I just want a compact saying about you know how much is there going to come out of this factory, yeah. and how much what how much we can put in. That's the function. So I don't know. What do you think? Jolly. Okay. Now, graphing. I think I don't remember at this point whether we graphed inequalities. Does anybody remember? Like on page uh, three twelve. If not, we can talk about it now, uh, because we're pretty good, I think, at graphing and systems of equations, but we may not have done, uh, actually, 311, and we can start there. Okay. So this is, make, you know, make up all the holes I left. Uh, so I want to get rid of that. Okay, so, and, uh, uh, let's try example two. That's on page 312, example two. OK, can somebody read that to me? x minus y greater than 5, and then 2x plus y is less than 0. Like this? Yeah. OK, now, this is two equations, two unknowns. We can still put this in a slope-intercept form, y equals mx plus b. So in this one here, I can write this as y1, right? I'm treating this, I'm going to look at them like equal signs for now, unless I multiply by a negative number. Remember, then it flips. But I'm going to call this, I'm going to subtract. It's OK to subtract. It doesn't change anything. So here I have 2x plus 2, you see? That's in the y-x-intercept form. And this guy. Right? I'm going to just add a y to both sides. So that way I don't have to multi worry about that negative. So I'm going to take x greater than, I'm going to add a y plus 5. You see that? Now I'm going to subtract a 5 so that I have x, right, minus 5 is greater than y. Do you see that? Now I'm going to write that over here as y2. And notice it's being poked with this sharp side here. So it's, it's being x sub 2 is going to be this one. See how I wrote it? What is the slope here? 1. What is the slope here? Negative 2. That means for 1 moving this way, you go down 2. You can write this as minus 2 over 1, rise over run. You can write this as 1 over 1, right? 45 degree line. Anyway. They're two different lines. Now, let's graph it. Well, how did we graph it when it was an equal sign? Well, this first line, we would go x. We made x and make a y. We made a little chart. And I asked you, what is y when x is 0? Yeah, it's just 2, right? So that's cool. And then the other one, actually, that's called the y-intercept, which you can read right off. But now the other one is, what happens if I set y equal to 0? So I look at this as equal to 0, right? So I'm just going to pretend that's an equal sign right now, because I just want a spot. So I'm going to look at this. I set that equal to 0. So it's like I have 0 equals 2x plus 2 minus 2x. So I'm going to add 2x just to keep it positive equals 2, right? So x would be equal to 1, right? So it's like that. Yeah? How about this guy? Let's do a chart for it. So x, y. Well, when x equals 0, 
y is? Yeah. Now, what happens when I set y equal to 0? So what I have is 0 equals x minus 5, right? So I can add 5 to both sides. Are we OK with this? Not yet, because I just want to get an idea of where these lines are going through. But I will now. So let's go back up to the y1, and let's graph it. OK? So I'm going to go like this. Here's capital X, and here's capital Y. OK, now, uh, let's see. What do I have here? When x, I said when y equals 0, uh, that shouldn't be 4, though, is it? Because when y equals 0, no, that's a one. so 1? Yeah. So fat, thick, distorted 1? OK. I'll try to put it on a diet. Yeah. OK, so let's mark our points. The first one, when x equals 0, y is 2. Yeah, that's right here. Do you agree? And now, when y equals 0, x is 1. That is a negative slope, correct? So this is a graph of y1, OK? Equals. Now watch, be careful. I'm going to not put the equals right now. I'm going to just put the rest of it. It's going to be y1 is minus 2x plus 2, right? So watch what happens here. Now, now I put in my inequality as I have it. It's like this, right? But I want you to put your finger on the y-intercept, right? And for a minute, forget this term here. So what does it say? I want all, you know, forget, I want y less than, less than 2. So that means that this guy is going to be all values underneath the graph, less than 2. It's every point underneath that. And because this is less than but not equal, I have to do this. I have to make this a dotted line. Because values on there will not work either. It has to be less than. So all of these problems, just put your finger on the y-intercept and ask, is y above or below? If it's below, it's all points below that line. If this were equal, less than or equal, this will be a solid line. No or yes? So now, how about the next line? Let's graph it. So this one was, that's weird, that one's 0. When x is 0, y is minus 5, right? True? Right about here? And now when y equals 0, x is 5. That makes sense because it's a 45 degree line. 1, 2, 3, 4, well, not too good. But it looks something like this. OK, and that's going to be the graph of y2 is less than x minus 5. Now, put your finger on the y-intercept, which is minus 5, right? Do you see it? OK, I want all y values less than minus 5. Guess what that means? That means everything, right? And let me extend this line here, because it goes forever. Right. And then I'll continue with this, see? Do you see that? And guess what? I have to change this to this, to, to dotted line, because it will not include points that are actually on the line. OK? Now, what's my solution set? My solution set is only where these guys are overlapping. Only x and y values in this thing here will be, will be allowed as a possible solution for both equations. For example, let me just take a value, for example. Let's say this is 1, 2, 3. And let me try, for example, 3, 5. 
three comma five. So three, one, two, three, and one, two, three, four, five. Maybe, maybe something like here. Well, I can see it's lying in the set of where I've got overlap, correct? Oh yeah, good point. Negative five, and this is gonna be three. So I'll put this as negative five, right? So now we can take a look at this. And let's see if it holds. No, okay. Now, in other words, if x is equal to 3, right? And y is equal to minus 5, right? Minus a minus 5 makes that a plus 5. So I have 3 plus 5. Do you see that? Is that greater than 5? It does. It works. But now we have to try it on the second one. The second equation is this. So again, x is 3, so that's 6. And now I take 6 and I subtract minus 5. And what do I have? One. So is that 1 less than 2? It works. Let's pick one that's outside. Let's say, let's try 3, comma, 4. I'm pretty sure that's outside our set. It should be a violation of this. So if I take 3, 3 minus 4 is minus 1, right? which is not greater than 5. So only all the coordinates that lie in this system here, anything in here, do you understand what I'm saying? That's the solution set. Before we had two lines intersect, it was one spot. Now we have a whole range of things that are possible solutions to these inequalities. What's the key? The key is, in my mind, to learn how to which way these things go is to put your finger on the y-intercept and just ask the question about whether you want bigger y's or, low or smaller y's. Then that means it's true for the whole set of lines. Because you can have problems, word problems, economic problems, where the solution x, y may be more than one possible solution. It could be anything in this range that would be profitable, say. Any questions? I was expecting maybe somebody to ask them as a question when they're doing their homework, but I guess you already know how to do them. Um, let's try number 21. Oh, I don't know if he told you, but we're going to start to do every third odd problem, so maybe in the hopes that some of you will get caught up. Uh, well, it's number 21, but it's on page 314. All right. Now. Okay. Can somebody read me that problem? Oops. Negative four. Right? Yeah or no? Is that, did I got it right? Do I have a copy to write? Okay. This bothers me. This is kind of freaky too. Okay. So, how do we graph this? Well, let me ask you. Let's suppose I have this graph. Okay, let's suppose I don't have it. Let's suppose now I have it. Okay, now, watch what I'm going to do here because I'm going to go to these guys directly and I want you to tell me what this looks like. What is the graph of x equals 4? What does it look like? Well, can you graph x equals 4? If y is equal to zero, we're, right? Can you graph it? Uh, yes. Uh, so it's right here, right? Does it care what the y value is? It doesn't. There is no y value. For any y value, it doesn't care. This is the graph of x equals 4, which has an undefined slope. It's super steep or infinite steep. You see? That's what that equals. Now, 
Let's go back to what it says here. Actually, it's minus four, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so one, two, four. So this is x equals, this would be the graph of x equals minus four. Okay, we're okay with that? Now I want you to graph. Well, before I do that, what do I really have, though? I don't have equals. So I want, look what it says. I want all x, oh, wait, I still did it wrong? No, yeah, it's OK here. Now put your finger on there, and you want all x's that are greater than minus 4. Well, that would be this way, right? So the graph of that would be everything going like this, headed off that direction. Do you see it? But this one still is going to have to be, in this case, oh, look, you can actually do it. I didn't know you could do that. Oh, it kind of does it. No, I don't like it. Oh, yeah. It's like, cool. <laughs> I learned something new. Wow, I don't have to go. Da, 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 da. This is not here anymore, this black line. You understand? You know what I'm talking about? Because they don't want, actually, minus 4 as a solution. Now, how would I graph this guy? Y, <laughs> that looks pretty cool. Y equals 2. Negative 2. Negative 2. That's going to be tough because it'll try to put a hole in there. Uh, negative 2. So, well, just graph on the thing Y equals minus 2. 1, 2, right? Correct? Now, it doesn't care what the X values are. It will always hold. So, it looks like this. Oh, yeah. Right? And I want all, what do I want though? I'm talking about y now, right? I want, I put my finger here and I want all the values of y that are greater than minus 2. So that must look like this. Oh, I don't want my, actually that looks pretty good. Yeah, I kind of like that. Right? But we're not done, because we have yet another, it's called a constraint. What am I going to do? What form will I put that in? What form is it in now? Standard, Standard form, because both variables are on the same side. What sign do I want to put it in? Well, humans like to have it in the slope-intercept form. So I'm going to subtract the 4x, do you see? So I'm going to have a 5, whoa. That looks psychedelic here. I'm gonna be, <laughs> let me go back here. That's what happens when it's too much drugs. Uh, you start to hallucinate. OK. So over here, I'm going to subtract. You see a 5x. So I have 5y. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's true. I get ahead of myself. I should count how many errors I make in a day. Let's see there. Just to depress myself. OK, so 5y. There's another error. Why didn't it work? I didn't hit it strongly. Oh, do I have to do that first? Yeah. OK, so I'm back again. I'm going to have 5y, right, is less than minus 4x plus 8. Well, that's looking a lot kind of like slope-intercept form, right? Except I'm going to divide by 5. And I can, since it's a denominator, common denominator, I can put each one under 5 so that I have 5 is less than minus 4 over 5x plus 8 over 5. Do you see that? Slope is negative. You run 5 and go down 4. Run 5, go down 4 consistently. So I can make a little chart now. When x is equal, x and y, when x equals to 0, what's y? Yeah, 8 fifths. And that's uh, approximately what? It goes in there, what? 1 and 3, one and three fifths, something like that? OK, now how about if I set y equal to 0? Well, that's a little more complicated, because I have 0 less than or equal to minus 4x, right? And then that's over 5, correct? And then I have 8 fifths. 
Well, I'm going to clear out the denominator, right, by multiplying both sides by 5, correct? This is nice, because 5 times 0 is going to be 0, so this is 0. And now, when the 5 sits over here, right, it's just going to divide out. So I have just what's on top. Do you see that? Now, how am I going to get that x by itself? I'm not going to subtract the 8 because I like positivity in my life and I don't want to have to worry about flipping the sign. So I'm going to add 4x to both sides. When I add 4x, right, I'm going to have add 4x, right, so I'm going to have less than, right, 8. So I don't really worry about the x, right, less than, right? I know that x is going to be, when y equals 0, x is going to be close to 2, which is all I needed was this. Now I can graph it. The first point, 1 and 3 fifths, well, when x is 0, y is 1, and 3 fifths, I'd have to divide that in 5 and pick about 3 of them. So that's the y-intercept right there. Okay. And now the other one says when y equals 0, x is 2. When y equals 0, x is 2, right? Is that right? Let's see, line 2. Isn't that supposed to be a negative? That's a negative slope, isn't it? Yeah, it's a negative slope, so that's not right, because that's a positive slope. So let's see. Uh, OK. Well, that's true. When x is equal to 0, it's 1 and 3 fifths, right? But when y is equal to 0, y is equal to 0. Oh, I got that in the wrong place. When y equals 0, wait, that is my x-axis, isn't it? That's OK. Okay, I started from here. I subtracted a 4x. Then I divided by 5. Then I multiplied by 5. That's right. And then I brought the x over. And x is 2. Actually, Look at right here, when y is equal to 0, this whole thing is 0, so x is equal to 2. And then, let me see, and when x equals, when x equals maybe, x equals 0, oh, wait a minute, okay, wait a minute, oh, that is 8 fifths, isn't it? <coughs> 8 fifths, oh, okay, wait a minute, I don't know what I did. I'm on the bottom side. This is the x-axis. So it should have been right 1 and 3 fifths. OK, so that goes like this. Mystery solved. Where that equation is like y is something like, well, actually, let me, let me. I actually want to do this, right, this cool one. OK, but I put my finger on here. Uh, look, I'm right here. And ignore this. I want all values of y what? Greater than this point or less? Uh, there's my y-intercept, right? It's 1 and 3 fifths. See it? So do I want y values greater or less? Yeah, I want y less than the y-intercept. Okay? So that would be values going like this. OK. So if I have this, uh, these are values that are, you know, like, uh, so on this guy, actually could continue like this, right?
And this guy will be something like this, right? It will go. Because this thing's going like this, see? Yeah. And this is going to go. Okay, now, the solution set is where the three overlap. Yeah. This is meant to kind of clear up this mess. So you can see what it's going to be. It's going to be a trapezoid. It's going to be, I'm going to do it in, uh, I don't know what I'll do it in. I'll do it in black. So it's actually something like a trapezoid. It's going to be everything, not including this line, right? And then going to here, x equals like minus 1. And then it is down like that. You know, and this will go all the way down there. So it's this region in here. So these were just other graphs, right? Vertical and horizontal. And then either on left or right or up or down. Is that cool? I think it's pretty cool. Myself. But those are things that I had skipped there, but it should be pretty easy because you're already experts at graphing. The rest is just a trick about putting your finger there and looking at the intercept. Is that okay? Yeah. Any questions about that? Okay. You guys are um, caught up. It says. Um, This has to do it. On page 323, they got a word problem there, but uh, number 48. So you have two cars leave at the same place and traveling opposite direction. One car travels 30 miles faster than the other. After two and a half hours, I don't see why that would be an inequality. Oh, okay, that makes sense. All right. Can we review it or can you remember it? Well, let's do it. What the hell of it? This is uh, two cars now, right? One's red and blue. Is that blue? So I can actually use my colors. So I have a car going this way. Oh, yeah, that looks cool. And uh, I'll need some. I need some tires. This is, this is what we call this the hump car. And then this is the distance between them. So we know in a certain amount of time, right, the distance between this, by the way, this is going this way in case you can't tell. And this car, which is the red car, that one will probably look more like. All right, that's going this way. So it says that they're, uh, let's say they started at the same point. I really don't know well, which car is going faster. Let's say it says here. Um, one car travels faster than the other. They don't really tell you. But I'm sure you know that the total distance between themselves, between the two of them, is how many miles? You see that? You're, you're on the right place? 265 miles, right? And uh, let's just say that for the sake of argument that the red car is faster. So I would expect to put a starting point. Would I put it in the middle? No, where would I put it? Yeah. I would expect something like this. But I don't really care. Have they been on the road the same amount of time? Yeah, they have. So what is time equal to? Great. Do not show, yeah, I better know. I wonder if my battery. No, I'm saying time. What, how much time are they on the road? So like 2.5 or whatever. Or OK. 
Okay, so I have a situation. Would it be the fact that my battery might be shot by now, or would it be one of these ozone things that we never know? Who is that? Oh, I thought they were sending us signals. Okay, so they were at 2.5 hours on the road? Yeah. Okay, so. So, let's see. So I know that this is the distance traveled by the slow car. And this is the distance traveled by the fast car. Do you know what I mean by that? This distance and this distance. So look how this helps me set up an equation. Because I know that the distance plus the slow car plus the distance of the fast car is going to be equal to 265 miles, correct? And I also know what? What is the equation for distance? times time. Well, let's start like this. When you're traveling in your car and you're looking at your speedometer, what does it tell you? And miles is a measure of distance. And hours is a measure of time. So solve for D. What's D equal to? What? What's it equal to? I know what, I'm asking what does distance, I want distance by itself. Well, what does, how do I get the D by itself? I don't want this T there. How do I get rid of it? Multiply by a T. Don't you see? This is just basic algebra. Well, so distance is equal to what she was saying, the rate, which is we call speed, or velocity times time. Right? If you're going 60 miles an hour for one hour, you've covered 60 miles, you understand? You have to know that or you can't solve these kind of problems because I got it in terms of distance. But the question is about their relative speeds. So by solving for this, I got something in terms of speed. So I can rewrite this, right? This is the speed of the slow car times time. Times time. Maybe I have to. Times time. Well, maybe you can pretend you can see it. No. Something is required here. I got a feeling it's acting like a battery, huh? Okay. So let's see what happens if I change it. Then it'll stop working altogether. Yeah. Watch it work as I change the battery. Just before I change it out, it goes working. There, it's too late. Oh, that worked. See, that's from many years of schooling. One learns to change the battery every now and then. I'm not sure that actually fixed it. Oh, well, what's D? Oh, that's T, but guess what? The T is the same, right? Both of them have been on the road the same amount, true? This is a plus sign. And this is speed of the fast car times time, right? And that equals 265, correct? But I know they've been on the road two and a half hours. So actually, I mean, if you want to, I mean, you can write this as 2.5. Put the T on this side, speed of the slow car, plus 2.5 times the speed of the fast car, right, equals, <laughs> equals 265, right? Now, I can move the decimal one over, right, by just multiplying by 10, so that I end up with 25 speed of the slow car plus 25 speed of the fast car equals 265, right? Now, I cannot solve this right now because I have two unknowns, right? Guess what? Dun, dun, dun. Teeter totter time. Which one do you think is faster, the speed of the fast car or the speed of the slow? That's a brain twister. 
I say that the highest the number would be the speed of the fast car over the speed of the slow car, yeah? Let me see, yeah? Yep. Okay, now it's telling us in there that it's what? How many times? Or how much faster is it? Yeah, so I'm going to have to add something to the speed of the slow. You understand? So that I would get a balanced teeter-totter as speed of the fast is going to be equal to speed of the slow plus 30. 30. Oh, guess what I can do now? Now I can do a stuff it up your, your turkey thing here. I can take this S of F and stuff it into my S of F and have everything in terms of F of S of S. Okay, right? So I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to rewrite it, right? But then I'm going to write that as 25 speed of the slow car, right? Plus, now I have 25. However, the speed of the fast car has a new name. You can call me speed of the fast car, or you can call me, in parentheses, the speed of the slow car plus 30. And that equals to 265. Do you see? Look, now I can solve it because I have everything in terms of one kind of variable. So what do I have? 25 speed of the slow, right? And now I have to use this guy here. I should have put this in a different color, but look. So that's going to be another 25 speed of the slow plus, you know, what, 750? Does that look right? 25 times 30? That's 75. Yeah. Equals, am I forgetting a zero here? I multiplied by 10, right? Okay, I feel better. Equals uh, 2650. 25 times 5 is what? 25? 25, that's, where's the 5? Oh, never mind, sorry. That's my new name. I know it looks kind of. Okay, so do you agree that I have in total 50 speed of the slow car? plus 750 equals 2650, yeah? Is that right? So what am I going to subtract? Yeah, I'll subtract 650, right? So that's almost like taking 650 plus another 100, right? So uh, speed of the thing, speed of the slow car equals and uh, so I'll be under a thousand, right? Nineteen hundred. I mean, nineteen hundred. So I'll divide both sides by fifty. And the speed of the slow car will be. Well, that'll design out. You know, that's like dividing ten top and bottom. So I just simply have, you know, five goes into nineteen. What three times? And three times five, fifteen, at least four, what, so eight? Thirty-eight? I don't know, somebody tell me. Okay. Yeah, that's three. That's fifteen. That's four. Yeah. Thirty-eight? Oh, guess what? Now I know, how am I going to find my... I go to my teeter-totter. That's the translator. Parlez-vous français, oui, oui. Right? It has to talk the same language. So guess what 38 plus 30 is? Yeah, so now I'm done. So isn't that kind of pretty? Could I graph it? I sure could, because I call this y and x. You know? And t is just a coefficient. Why did I, what do I know to help me solve it? First of all, I know the distance, total distance. What you have to know is the distance of the two is going to add up to the total difference. That makes sense. But there's nothing in this that tells us what the, you know, how much distance they, actually we can cover, calculate now, can't we, how much distance each one is covered. Because we know what the speed of the slow car is, and we know the time that it's been on the road. We know that same thing, right? So if you didn't know speed is equal to distance over time, that's going to be a problem because I have to substitute e for another way of calling distance is equal to because I have to introduce the variable of s 
speed and time. And even as I walked it down to the beginning, I have something in terms of two variables still, speed of the slow and speed of the five. It's the teeter-totter that gives us the missing equation, which is the other equation that you would graph normally to intersect is the teeter-totter. This guy, this could be y equals x plus 30, for example. Now then I stuff my speed of the fast car into the speed of the fast car so that I have something in terms of just speed of the slow car. And then doing the algebra, I solve the speed of the slow car, and you go back to your translator, which is the balanced teeter-totter. Right? And that simply reads off. Huh? Any questions? That's probably a good review. Oh, uh, that's enough for you. You want more? You want, you want more? Yeah. It was the first one I was going to grade, and I go, oh, no. Oh, do you need to test? What? Do you need to test, or can you figure out what the answers are? Um. <sighs> Means you need to test. Let's see if I got one here. Here's one, I think. I need someone that you just to keep me straight. Let's see. Oh, I know. I have to get off. Yeah. Wow. Is that how long? 